The person I'm closest to in my family is definitely my mum, Kate. We've always got on and we hardly ever fall out. I know that's unusual. She's really outgoing and sociable. She's always going out with friends and colleagues. Everyone thinks she's good fun. I look up to her because she's so hard-working. She never sits still and she works long hours. She can be a bit impatient, though. She gets annoyed when her colleagues aren't as efficient as her. I take after her in that. I'm impatient, too. And she's oversensitive, often getting offended for seemingly no reason. 2. My cousin Kieran and I grew up together. We were inseparable. He was so creative. He'd always think of new games we could play and make up these stories to make me laugh. I was constantly amazed by his open-mindedness as well. He was never judgmental. I wish I could be like that. Unfortunately, we grew apart, slowly but surely, and by the time we went to uni, we weren't in touch anymore. I haven't seen him for years. It's really sad. I would blame it partly on the fact that he's not very reliable. So, for example, if I email him, he won't respond. I'm not sure what he's up to these days. 3. I know this is a cliché, but I don't get on with my in-laws, especially my mother-in-law, Jane. She's so nosy, always wanting to know what we're doing and who we're with, and she's terribly blunt, which means she quite often upsets us with things she comes out with. And then she can be quite stingy. When we go out for a meal with her and my father-in-law... She never offers to pay, even though they're much better off than us. I must say, though, she's extremely clever, and I do respect her for that. She set up her own business five years ago, and it's gone from strength to strength. She's so self-assured and ambitious, too, which I suppose is why she's so successful in business. Tell me something about your family. Although I live abroad now, my mum's family is from Paris and my dad's family is from Toulouse, so I'm from a very French family. Um, I would say I come from quite a small family, really. Uh, for example, I just have one older sister and four cousins, but it's true that my extended family is fairly big. What do you like doing most with your family? I like having nice long meals with good food and good wine, um, and a few jokes for dessert. Who are you close to in your family? In my family? Well, I'm close to my Uncle Jacques. He's a chef. He's hilarious, always telling jokes, um, and he's very enthusiastic about everything he does. We spent a lot of time together when I was growing up, in fact, he helped to bring me up. In what way is your family important to you? My family is everything to me. <laughs> they are my best friends. They support me when things aren't going well and when things are going well. Um, I know they'll always be there for me, no matter what. One of my best friends is a guy called Raoul. I met him at uni in Barcelona, where we were in the same study group. When was that? I suppose it was over ten years ago now, so yes, we've known each other for a good decade. We got to know each other on the tennis courts, because the first few days of our course were so boring that we both decided we'd be better off outside playing tennis. What kind of person is he? Well, he's very active, a sporty type involved in hiking and mountain biking, a bit of an adrenaline junkie. He's also a very determined person. When he gets into something, he gives 100%. And he changes passions often. That makes him a bit of a self-absorbed person, actually, which I'd say is a drawback. And I think he comes across as full of himself sometimes. I'm in a bit too sure of his own opinions. As for why I like him, well, he's actually quite different from me. At uni, 
He'd often suggest doing something and I'd go along with it. And because I'm laid back, I never felt overwhelmed by him. We've never fallen out or anything. How often do you see your friend? Well, because we live in different countries, we don't see each other that often. But we try to catch up on a fairly regular basis, say, three times a year. In what ways have families changed in the last hundred years? In Western countries, I would say families have become more widely dispersed and less close. People travel more and then end up living far away from their families. I think this is a shame because it means there is a breakdown of communities. I also think that because families are spread over a wider geographical area, elderly people tend to be forgotten and usually live on their own. Should we rely heavily on our families, or is it better to try to be independent? Mm, people seem to like living independently from each other these days, but I do wonder if that's the best way. Relying on people is seen as a weakness by some, I think. However, having family nearby is invaluable when you have children, in my opinion. Who else can be called on to babysit at a moment's notice? The elderly are sometimes considered the wisest members of society. What do you think we can learn from them? Oh, an immense amount. They're our living link with the past, of a family, a region, a country. They're the keepers of local traditions, for example, and they provide a sense of identity to younger generations. Sample answers. What do you expect from a good friend? Uh, for me, um, a good friend has to be reliable. I can't stand being stood up or having my emails and texts ignored. As well as that, a friend should be someone you can have good fun with. There are many things in life to be serious about, but friendship shouldn't be one of them. I also believe that opposites attract, in friendships just as in romance, so a good friend will most likely be very different from you in many ways. Are friends as important to you as family? Mm, no, I wouldn't say so. Friends come and go, but family are always there, whether you like it or not. You can even be rude to your family, uh, not that it's advisable, of course and they will forgive you. But sometimes you've known a friend for so long, they can become like a family member. You can really be yourself with them, and you may even argue quite often, uh, like siblings do. Do you think friendships change as we get older? Well, I definitely find that I have less in common with some friends than I used to. I sometimes wonder what we used to find to talk about. And so you often grow apart from old school friends or old colleagues. Mm, the people I feel I have most in common with are friends I met at university. I'm not sure why, but we somehow always have lots to talk about. Track 8 It's by far my favourite sport to watch. I love the excitement that builds up as the match progresses, with the fans cheering and chanting. There's always an amazing atmosphere. My team usually loses, it has to be said, although last week they drew. When they play away, I always try to go and support them, and I've got the latest kit, but they're getting more and more expensive, so I may have to stop buying them. I think the clubs take advantage of fans' loyalty to push up the prices. Team sports are a fantastic way for young people to improve their fitness. I coach a junior team at the weekend. We don't train in a stadium, of course, just on a pitch in our local park. I was really delighted last week when our youngest player scored the winning goal with a beautiful header. I think he might prove to be a real up-and-coming talent. What do you do to keep fit? I go to the gym twice a week. I don't really enjoy it, to be honest, but it's an easy way to keep fit. 
I mainly do cardiovascular exercises rather than muscle building. Are you good at sport? Mm, not really, but I try my best. I prefer individual sports to team sports because if I do badly in a team game, I always feel I'm letting everyone down. What sports do you play? I go kite surfing sometimes. I enjoy it because it's so exhilarating. I can't go often though, because there's rarely enough wind where I live. I might take up another water sport instead. What is the most popular sport in your country? Hmm, I'd say the most popular sport is football, as in most countries. Most people have a favourite team who they support through thick and thin. The teams are often English ones, and Manchester United is the most well known. Track thirteen. I'd like to talk about the most exciting tennis match I've ever seen. It was about six years ago,、uh, just outside Bordeaux in France, and it was the boys' final of a junior championship. My favourite player, a rising star, had got to the final, so I wanted to see him. At the time, I didn't know anyone else who was interested in tennis. All my friends preferred football. So I went on my own. I set off really early to make sure I got there on time, but I ended up being too early, and I had to wait for two hours for the match to start. It didn't matter though, because this meant I got one of the best seats right at the front in the middle of the court. I was delighted about that. Other people gradually started arriving. The seats filled up, and we waited expectantly for the players. When the match started, it soon became clear that I was practically the only person supporting Jean Martin. Most people were there to support the other guy who had won the previous two years and was the favourite to win this year too. Every time Paul Fernandez won a point, the crowd erupted into applause. But I sat silently, getting more and more anxious. Martin lost the first set, but then. There was a dramatic turnaround. He suddenly seemed to find some self-belief, and he started to win. That's what I love about tennis. It's a battle of the mind as much as the body. I find it interesting to see how some players may be highly skilled, but don't have the mental strength to win. Martin obviously did have this strength, and Fernandez was slowly falling apart. The atmosphere was electric. Martin showed off his amazing skills, hitting ball after ball straight down the line. Martin served for the match. You could have heard a pin drop. When he served an ace, the crowd went wild. Although they had begun by supporting his opponent, they had grown to respect him for his cool head and control of the ball. When he was presented with a trophy, he cried with joy. Do you play tennis yourself? Yes, I'm a keen tennis player. I joined a club about two years ago and play all the time. What are the best ways to keep fit? The best way to keep fit is to do exercise that raises your heart rate. The heart is a muscle and has to be worked like any other muscle. So golf, in my opinion, is not the best form of exercise. Something like jogging or swimming or surfing is much more beneficial. Do you think most people consider exercise a chore, or do they find it fun? I think most people feel it is something they should do. That is a mistake, as far as I'm concerned. Because the best way to exercise is not to think about the fitness aspect and just have fun. You can exercise without even noticing you're doing it. If you play volleyball with your friends, or go snorkeling, or go for a long walk on a sunny day, or something like that. What is the most popular form of exercise in your country? I would say the most popular form of exercise is going to the gym, 
I'm in two minds about the gym as a way to keep fit. On the one hand, it is convenient, but on the other hand, a gym is a very controlled environment, somewhat lacking in imagination and spontaneity. Healthy lifestyles. Do you think people in your country are less healthy than they used to be? Yes, definitely.、Um, I would argue that the invention of TV has led to people being much too sedentary. I know some people who refuse to have a television because they think that without one they are much more likely to keep active. It's all too easy to become a couch potato. Also, most people work in offices, so they just sit in a chair all day long and only move to go to the photocopier. That's very unhealthy. People used to work the land, and so be on the go from morning till night. Obesity was unknown then,、uh, except among the super rich, I imagine. How can we encourage young people to stay healthy? Parents should set a good example, but I strongly believe that schools have a crucial role to play. Not only can they offer a wide range of sports for children to play, they can teach them about eating a balanced diet and the negative effects of eating junk food and not exercising. If children don't hear all this from home, they have to hear it from somewhere. Um, and I would argue that it's the school's responsibility. Once they get a taste for playing sports, they will love the sense of achievement it can give you, and the feeling of camaraderie with your teammates. And then, hopefully, they won't ever want to stop playing sports. Should governments intervene to force people to be healthier? Hmm. I'm highly sceptical of the idea that governments should force their citizens to be healthy. People ought to be encouraged to lead healthy lives, but not forced to.、Um, they could, for example, run an ad campaign showing people how to eat a balanced diet.、Uh, that you need to eat some carbohydrates, some vegetables and fruit, some meat, and so on. I think most people don't know that. But I'm unconvinced that trying to force people into healthy habits would work,、uh, because when bullied like that, people tend to resent it and react by sticking even more firmly with their unhealthy lifestyles.、Mm. The one area where I strongly believe legislation is necessary is with smoking. Smokers can harm others through passive smoking, so they should not be allowed to smoke in public places. In fact, this has just recently been outlawed in my country. Track fifteen. My name's Mubarak, and I'm from the United Arab Emirates. My favourite subject at school was maths. I really loved it. I think primarily because I liked being able to use logic to work out answers, rather than having to speculate and theorise, as you often do in art subjects. I went on to study for bachelor's and master's degrees, both in mechanical engineering at Leeds University in England. I chose that subject because, although I was more keen on maths, engineering is more practical. My decision to study in Britain was motivated by the high prestige of British qualifications back in my home country. The tuition fees are very high for foreign students, but my family paid them for me. I found the course very challenging. English is, of course, not my mother tongue, so I found some of the lectures and seminars hard to follow. As a result, I failed my first year exams. I had to retake them all, but then, thankfully, I passed. I always did well in my coursework because I could take time to research the topic and check my English.、Hmm. My dream job would be to work as a mechanical engineer for the United Arab Emirates Army. The reasons are that such a job carries high prestige. It would be interesting, and there would be good job security. If I got such a job, I would probably have it for life. Do you work or are you a student? 
I've just finished secondary school.、Uh, I got the best results in my year, so I'm hoping to get a scholarship to study English literature. Why did you choose that course?、Mm, because I love literature. I love getting lost in a book. I mean, it's a form of escapism for me. But I also enjoy learning about the historical and cultural contexts that influenced a work, and I'll have ample opportunity to learn about these things at university. What was the most difficult thing about your studies?、Um, at secondary school,、uh, the most difficult subject for me was chemistry. <laughs> I can't stand science, and I would dread every lesson. I struggled in chemistry lessons, and I had to work really hard to pass my exam.、Uh, for some reason, I just couldn't remember all those chemical symbols and equations, no matter how long I spent revising. Track seventeen. My dream job would be to teach children to sail. I have some qualifications in skippering, for example. But it's very likely I would need more, such as a teaching certificate from the Yachting Association. I have some of the right experience in that I've been sailing a long time. I'm confident in handling a yacht, and I've dealt with many minor crises in my time, like getting trapped in storms and saving someone who'd fallen overboard. It's true that I've never taught anyone, but I don't think that would be a problem, provided I was given adequate training. I'm quite good with people and can explain things clearly. I imagine the job would involve encouraging youngsters to try sailing for the first time, and also teaching them that by working together as a team, they could discover they have hidden strengths. The most difficult thing would be having sufficient patience when the children didn't do as they were told. I suspect it would be frustrating if they didn't realise that the rules were there for their own safety. Why is it my dream job?、Hmm. It's my dream job because I love sailing. It's been my hobby for decades, and I'd like to work in a nice, warm climate where all I'd need to worry about was making sure I had suntan lotion on and enough to drink. When did you learn to sail? I learned when I was a small boy. My dad taught me, as he was a very skilled sailor. He taught my brothers and sister too, and we're all very pleased he did. Education. Do you think science subjects are more useful than art subjects? Uh, I think they are more useful because they are primarily concerned with、uh, practical matters. If you study science, you might,、uh, for example, go on to have some kind of technical role in the production of a device,、um, like a computer or a car. However. All great leaders have studied more arty subjects, such as、um, philosophy, history, and economics. This makes them better leaders because they have an understanding of human nature. Are、uh, young people mature enough to choose what to study themselves, or should their parents decide for them?、Uh, I think success in studying comes from being highly motivated to study a specific subject area, and、um, therefore the student should choose which subject they're interested in.、Um, by way of an example, I had a friend who studied science A levels because his parents pushed him down that route, but he hated it and so didn't get very good results. He still graduated and managed to get a place at university, where he studied law, and he became a top student because law was what he was interested in. In your country, does having a university education help you into a better career? Yes, it does. As all top companies recruit graduates for their top positions, therefore you、uh, get a better start. However. It's fair to say that a university degree is not everything, and it's what you do with it that matters.、Um, you can have a degree yet still get overtaken by somebody who isn't university educated, but who gets promoted over you because they work harder. Motivation. 
Do you think older or younger workers are more motivated? Um, younger workers should be more motivated because everything in their job is new to them and therefore exciting, and they have to build their career, which is all ahead of them. Um, older workers have a tendency to think they've seen it all and very often just wait for retirement. I do know of at least one older person who's made a point of retiring on a high, and is therefore highly motivated to get a project delivered to a very high standard before he retires.、Um, but no matter how fascinating your job is, when you reach the end of your career,、um, I suspect you mainly focus on your impending retirement. How can managers increase motivation among their workforce? Um, allocating the right tasks to the person with the right skills, but making every task slightly different so that they learn every time, that can lead to an increase in motivation. It's about making the job interesting, but without drowning staff in too much new information each time. Um, if they see that they can progress steadily and meet the challenges set, then they'll stay motivated. Are people more motivated if their job involves helping others? Although my job doesn't really involve helping people, just training them, I'd hazard a guess that youth workers, for example, find it very rewarding helping a young person to achieve their personal goals、um, or overcome a personal challenge. I can imagine too that it gives a counselor tremendous job satisfaction. To know that if they weren't there to listen to their patients' problems,、uh, things would probably not turn out as well for them.、Uh, so yes, although it's impossible for me to know for sure, I'd say people with those kinds of jobs take more pleasure from their work and are motivated by something more profound than just money. Where I come from, it's almost always sweltering. Ours is an arid climate, and in most parts of the country, precipitation is very low. Can you believe that in the summer the temperature can exceed fifty degrees C? Speaker two. Sometimes I feel like it's constantly drizzling here, and it generally feels damp. In fact, right now it's pouring down. That does mean we have the most beautiful, lush, green countryside, though. And the climate is temperate, so we don't suffer from any extreme weather. Thank goodness. Speaker three. The weather here is notoriously changeable. People often think our country is very, very cold all the time, but ocean currents keep our climate fairly mild, considering the latitude. I don't mind our winters, which are bearable as long as you wrap up warm. But I don't like our summers because it never gets above twenty-five degrees C. Tell me about your country's climate. We have an extreme climate. Our winters are absolutely freezing, and our summers are boiling hot. That means that the people, the houses, the transport system, everything needs to be prepared to cope with every kind of weather. What's your favourite kind of weather? What I like most is hot, dry weather. I love being able to sit outside on a balmy evening with a drink, rather than cooped up inside like you are in the winter. Does the weather influence your mood? Yes, it certainly does. It's the rain that influences my mood the most. I hate it when it's raining. It makes me feel so down. It's hard to go out without getting soaked to the skin, anyway. And the sky is so dismal and overcast; it's miserable. Is it worse to feel too hot or too cold? Hmm. Well, I suppose if it's too cold, you can just wear more layers. But nevertheless, I prefer to be too hot. At least it means the weather is good, and you can always go for a swim to cool down. What I really can't stand is being cold and wet. That's the worst combination, and it makes me worry that I'm going to catch a cold. My favourite season is most certainly the summer, 
which is officially from June to September. <laughs> I say officially because the reality is that we generally get a very short summer, in that the weather is only really summery for a few weeks a year. The rest of the season merges with the others, being rather cold and rainy. The highest the temperature gets is about thirty, and when it gets that high, people start complaining because they're not used to such heat. This irritates me, to be honest, because my view is that we so rarely have hot weather that we should just appreciate it and enjoy it when we do. In this country, and especially in my region, you can't rely on good weather in the summer. I've been to many outdoor events like、uh, weddings, concerts,、uh, barbecues, and so on, where the organisers were optimistic about the weather, but where it rained non-stop. Of course, you can't blame them. If you can't organise an outdoor event in August, when can you? In the summer, I typically go abroad on holiday to places where scorching sunshine is practically guaranteed. This is because I am a sun worshipper and like to get a good tan. Having sun on my skin makes me feel healthy, though I am fully aware of all the dangers associated with too much exposure to the sun. When I am at home. I like to have friends over for barbecues, and we stay out in the garden all evening until it gets too chilly, or until it's time for them to go home. The reason summer is my favourite season is that sunshine makes me happy. It's a scientific fact that it releases endorphins. In fact, during the winter, many people in my country use light boxes which recreate the light of the sun. You have to sit and stare into the light, and it is intended to lift your mood. In the summer, though, you don't need such gadgets. You can just go outside, sit in the sun, and get a natural energy boost. It's wonderful. Do you dislike the winter?、Mm, no, I don't. All the seasons have something to offer. In the winter, it's nice to snuggle up inside with a mug of hot chocolate. Are people in your country concerned about protecting the environment? To be honest, no. I think the middle and upper classes are more interested in earning as much money as they can, in order to buy as much stuff as they can. And there are many people in my country who live below the poverty line, and they quite literally can't afford to worry about the environment when they're struggling to put food on the table and just survive. Does the responsibility for protecting the environment lie with governments or with individuals?、Mm. In my view, the responsibility lies with all of us. However, individuals, at least in my country, aren't taking action of their own accord, and nor are businesses. They're just out to make a profit. Therefore, it falls to governments to force people to be more green. Um, for example, by fining companies that release toxic waste into our rivers, or incentivising us to recycle. Does it help to educate young people on being green? Almost certainly it does, because it is the next generation who will have to take on the huge burden of saving the planet. This generation isn't doing enough and is too worried about money. So I pray that the next one will see the urgency of the situation. And the way to get them to see that is to teach them about the repercussions of a polluting lifestyle such as ours. Pollution. What effects does pollution have on the environment? <sighs> oh, I hardly know where to start. Pollution in the oceans kills fish, and so unbalances the ecosystem. Pollution on land means that whole areas become unfit to live on or to farm. Habitats are destroyed, which leads to the extinction of hundreds of animal and plant species. Do you think we pollute more now than we did fifty years ago? Well, yes, overall. I'd say though that richer countries pollute less themselves, but export their pollution elsewhere. By which I mean that they consume foreign products that have a large carbon footprint. 
Um, it, it has become fashionable to be green in wealthier nations, especially Western ones. So people make an effort to cycle to work and recycle their waste. However, it's quite a shallow attempt at being green, in my opinion, because they still live in big houses using lots of energy and go on holidays abroad, leaving a trail of pollution in their wake. What do you think will happen if we don't reduce current levels of pollution? Hmm. I read an article recently that claimed if we don't change our ways, we will need a second planet to meet our needs as early as 2030. It's frightening to think that we're that greedy, and I'm sure I'm just as guilty as the next person. I do hold out some hope that things will get so bad that we will realise we really must act, and we will completely change our destructive habits just in the nick of time. If not, the planet will surely become uninhabitable. My mother tongue is Hungarian. It is spoken in Hungary and it is a minority language in the surrounding countries, especially Romania. It is not part of the same language family as European languages like uh, English, French, German or Russian. It is a Uralic language, distantly related to Finnish and Estonian. Because Hungarian is not a widely spoken language, if you want to get on, you have to speak a foreign language. Unsurprisingly, the most popular second language among Hungarians is English, the global language. Like most of my friends, I am multilingual. As well as Hungarian, I am fluent in English and German. I can also get by in Italian, and I did an evening course in Spanish a few years back, but I'm a bit rusty now. I seem to pick up languages quite easily, helped, I'm sure, by the fact that language teaching in Hungary is so good. It has to be, given that no one speaks our language but us. What's your mother tongue? My mother tongue is Portuguese. It's predominantly spoken in Brazil, but also in other parts of the world, such as Portugal and Africa. What other languages do you speak? Although I grew up in Brazil, I can also speak Italian, because my mother and one set of grandparents are Italian, and I grew up hearing the language all around me. I'm really proud to be bilingual, and I'd like my children to be bilingual too. What do you think is the best way to keep in touch with friends? It depends how far you are from your friends. If you are geographically close, you should meet up face to face. Long distance communication can cause misunderstandings and resentments to build up. When you write, you only have the words on the page, not body language or tone of voice. Do people keep in touch differently now compared to 50 years ago? Well, of course. People use the internet now and mobile phones. I'm quite young, but even when I was a teenager, nobody in my friendship circle had a mobile. Now it's seen as indispensable, and you would feel left out if you didn't have one. But, as I said before, I think it's better to meet up with friends than to communicate using technology. There's much to be said for communicating in so-called old-fashioned ways. A language I would like to learn is Spanish. It's used not only in Spain, but also in many other countries. Um, and I believe it's one of the most widely spoken languages in the world. Uh, so it's a language that is definitely worth knowing. It would be useful to me for business purposes. Also, uh, Spanish culture is becoming more and more influential internationally. It is, for example, overtaking English as the most widely spoken language in certain parts of the USA. It is influencing music and art. Uh, so, all in all, I think it's a handy language to know. I doubt it would be too challenging for me to learn Spanish, because it is a Latin language, um, just like my mother tongue, French. 
I think Spanish vocabulary would be easier for me to acquire than Spanish grammar. I understand the grammar is one of the most difficult things about the Spanish language. I would use Spanish primarily when going on holiday. I've been to Spain many times,、um, and I always find that if you go off the beaten track, it's difficult to find people who speak English. You get very good at speaking with your hands,、um, and it's difficult to really engage with people and understand the culture if you don't speak the language. Speaking Spanish would undoubtedly make my holidays a lot easier and、uh, more enjoyable. On top of that,、um, the company I work for has an office in Madrid, and it would also be very interesting to be able to work there. I would enjoy the challenge and the exposure to a new culture. It would be such an exciting opportunity.、Um, to make the move, though,、uh, I'd obviously need to be able to speak Spanish.、Uh, luckily, my company would most likely sponsor me to have Spanish lessons. Where have you been in Spain?、Um, I've been to Spain many times, and、um, each time I did a road trip. Uh, one trip was in the north of Spain,、um, travelling from France across the Pyrenees through the Basque Country and all the way down to Madrid. Is it considered important in your country to learn foreign languages? More than just important, it's considered essential. The English poet John Donne said, "No man is an island," and I think in this day and age. That is also true of countries. We are all intricately connected.、Um, a country that wants to do business abroad and、uh, export its goods has to know how to communicate with foreigners, and that means speaking foreign languages. What, in your opinion, is the best way to learn a language? Undoubtedly, the best way is to go and live in a country where the language is spoken as a native language. But that is not enough.、Um, I have friends who have done just that, but they stuck together with people who spoke their language, and so they hardly learnt anything.、Mm, you have to immerse yourself completely in the language and the culture. This takes courage, but is well worth the effort.、Uh, one of my friends went to study in England and got an English boyfriend. Her English improved dramatically in just a few months. So, arguably, that's the best way. Why are some people seemingly better at learning languages than others?、Mm, it's true that some people seem to pick up language really easily. Being bilingual from a young age certainly helps, because the more languages you speak, the more easily you acquire a new one. Another major factor is motivation. Uh, two people can study the same materials for the same number of hours, but the person who is more motivated will learn more and remember better what they learnt. I really believe that the more you care about learning a language, the more effortlessly you will pick it up. How do people in your country feel about English being the world language?、Mm, I don't think most people feel anything exactly. They just see it as something inevitable. They don't fight it because、um, that would just leave them trailing behind other countries that embrace English as the global lingua franca. Not learning English would leave us economically disadvantaged. Do you think the culture of English-speaking countries, as well as the English language, dominate the world? Hmm. The rise of the internet has certainly increased the dominance of English, and、uh, therefore also the spread of English and American ways of seeing the world. I think we are all expected to conform. Also, the majority of young people in my country like to watch American films and listen to American music. It's considered trendy to do so. So,、uh, yes. I would definitely say that the culture of English-speaking countries holds much sway all over the world. Why do you think people feel it is important to continue speaking their local languages? <sighs> 
there's a backlash in some quarters against the spread of English. One way this is expressed is by the insistence of maintaining local languages. A local language is more than just words. It、uh, links a community with its past, with its、um, heritage, and so if you stop speaking your language, you lose a part of yourself. Which language do you think is generally considered the most beautiful? Well, I think Italian is generally considered the most beautiful European language. It's probably because of the, um, the music of the language, the way speakers sound like they're singing. Personally, uh, I prefer Spanish. What do you use the internet for? I mainly use the internet to read newspapers and news items, mostly about sport. I also use it to do a bit of research on things to do and things to see at the weekends. I do a bit of internet shopping, like、uh, booking flights and accommodation for my holidays. Does everyone have access to the internet in your country?、Mm, I think so. Obviously, people in urban areas have wider access to the internet. It's still a very rural country, though. So, on second thoughts, I'm not sure that everybody is connected, and certainly not everyone has broadband. Do you think older people are scared of new technology? Some older people embrace new technology. My granddad, for example, was a technophile and wanted to keep up to speed with the latest technology. However. I would say that most older people don't bother learning about new technology, simply because they can't see what it would bring to their lives. Do you think young children should have mobile phones? Hmm. I can't see that young children have much use for mobile phones, at least in terms of using the phone as a phone. They might find it interesting to have a device to listen to music and take photos, but I can't imagine many young kids making calls. The piece of equipment I'd like to talk about is my iPhone, which is a smartphone. It has various uses. It functions as a normal phone, so you can make calls and text people. But more unusually for a phone, you can also surf the internet and send emails. It also acts as a camera, though admittedly not a very good one. You can buy applications from an online store, which allow you to find your way. Play games,、uh, read e-books, and much more besides. New applications are being added all the time, and some of them are really crazy, like one that lets you record your voice and then it plays it back to you, but making you sound like an alien. And last but not least, you can listen to your music and watch videos. It was a present from my parents. I'd been pestering them for months to get me one, and at last they gave in when it came round to my birthday. I think they bought it online, as it was cheaper that way. I was the first of my friends to get one, and I think they were all really envious. It is the latest must-have. People love it because it is so beautifully made, so intuitive, so robust, and so clever. It is because it is so many things rolled into one that it is so useful. I just love my iPhone, and if I lost it. I wouldn't know what to do with myself. I use it on the way to university to entertain myself. I use it to stay in touch with my friends. I use it to check where I am. It's not so much useful to me as <laughs> absolutely essential. What piece of electronic equipment would you not miss? Hmm, that's a difficult question, because I love gadgets and all things technological. Hmm. If I had to choose something, I'd say kitchen gadgets. What have been the most significant technological developments of recent years?、Uh, undoubtedly, ones connected with the internet.、Um, the internet has created a global village where everyone can easily and cheaply contact almost anyone in the world. Just to chat, or to do business, or to find love.
It's a revolution, the like of which I don't think has been seen before. Um, we have the internet at home through our personal computers, but also on the move through the use of smartphones and laptops. And um, so wherever we are, we have access to almost limitless sources of knowledge. In what ways have these developments changed society for the better and for the worse? Uh, well, as I said, um, they have brought people closer together in many ways. However, there are disadvantages. First of all, some people believe everything they read online, which is dangerous. Um, then many people spend too much time sitting in front of their computers rather than going out and socialising. Uh, so they put on weight. Um, they don't develop and maintain friendship circles. Last but not least. It can cut dead debate. When I'm in the pub with my friends, we no longer have a friendly, informal debate about which band has sold the most albums. We just check our smartphones and find the answer in a few seconds, and then have nothing left to say to each other. Are people in your country nostalgic about life before technology? Um. Yes, I think so. And not just the older generation; younger people too are beginning to see that community is not what it was, and that it is largely due to technological developments.、Um, for example, before the car, most people walked to work.、Uh, this meant that they lived close to their place of work, and so everyone lived and worked in the same area, and they all knew each other. Why do you think some people claim scientists interfere too much with nature?、Um, in my view, people are scared because scientists seem to be all powerful. They come up with some new discovery almost every week. There seems to be no end to it,、um, so people are bound to question whether it's right or not to delve so far into nature's secrets,、uh, manipulating genetic codes, and so on. But then maybe progress is always scary, and that's what keeps us interested.、Uh, it is challenging and thought-provoking. Do you have anything against animal testing? Um, I do, if it's for the purposes of cosmetics and other unnecessary luxuries. I'm not sure what I think of testing on animals for reasons of finding cures for human illnesses. Uh. But I think it's something I'd rather not talk about. To be honest, I don't feel comfortable discussing it. Is scientific progress always for the greater good?、Mm, not necessarily.、Uh, after all, scientists develop the atom bomb and all the efficient new ways we have of killing each other. What matters is that we keep on questioning scientists,、uh, letting them know that we are grateful for their discoveries. But we will not give them free rein. They need to keep morality in mind when they're working. What are your hobbies? There is no one thing I am fanatical about. I have various interests. I'm a keen cook and love to create new dishes and then invite my friends over to taste them. Um, I love playing cards, especially Uno. Most of my friends are crazy about karaoke. And I go with them from time to time, but it's not really my kind of thing. What is your favourite musical instrument? Hmm. What is my favourite instrument? I would have to say the piano. I'm not a big classical music fan on the whole, but I do love a bit of piano. It's the emotion it can express that fascinates me. The way man and instrument become one, and the pianist gets lost in the music. Do you prefer action films or comedies?、Mm, neither really.、Uh, if I had to choose between them, I'd pick comedies. But what I really like is horror films, especially those involving ghosts. I enjoy getting a good fright. Do you think it is important to read novels and poetry? Well, my teachers always told me it is, but reading, I can take it or leave it. I can't remember the last time I picked up a real page turner. I don't think it's important to read. You can be entertained by films, 
and you can be educated via the television, watching documentaries and so on. So uh, I don't feel I'm missing out on anything. One of my favourite hobbies is going shopping. I've always loved it. I think I get it from my mum, who used to take me to the nearest town every weekend to visit shops and boutiques. She taught me about buying a few quality items that you may pay a premium for, but that last a long time, so are a good investment. She also taught me about how to check for the quality of a garment by looking at the way it's sewn together, and also. Creasing the fabric to see if it stays creased or not. If it stays creased, then it's a poor quality fabric. Another thing I learned from her is how to find a bargain. You need to shop around and not be afraid of trying the smaller boutiques, where you're more likely to find a shop owner who's happy to offer a discount. I've been shopping on my own since I was a student. Then I could not afford to buy many things, but stuck to what my mum taught me and kept my eyes open for a quality bargain. The rest of the time, I would window shop. Nowadays, I can afford designer clothes, but I still love the sales when I hunt for a bargain and the odd top designer item. One thing I hate, however. Is trying things on because there are always long queues, and it means you have less time for shopping. It's not a problem not trying things on, because if something is not the right size, I can take it back to the shop as long as I've kept the receipt. I go shopping every week. I find it therapeutic. It always makes you feel good to get your hands on a nice quality piece at a bargain price. And if I'm feeling a bit down, there's nothing like a bit of retail therapy. I find shopping exciting as well. You spend time in the poshest part of town, where you can mix with fashionable people. There's a buzz, and it's busy and noisy and colourful. Shopping lets you keep up to speed with the latest trends. So all in all, I think it has a lot of benefits, and I love it. What's the best bargain you've ever got? Hmm. I once bought a designer coat, a hundred percent cashmere, absolutely beautiful, for twenty-five percent of the full price. It was in a closing down sale. Do you think men and women tend to have different types of hobbies? Um, yes, I do. The men I know have sports as hobbies. The women usually enjoy more sedentary and peaceful hobbies, like um, reading or crafts. Having said that, there are of course women who love exhilarating hobbies, or are fanatical about cycling or something. And there are men who take up pottery or sewing. There are always exceptions to every rule. Why do some people get obsessed with their hobby? I think everybody finds at least one thing absolutely fascinating. It can be anything: subjects like、um, history of art, or a sport like basketball, or a craft like、um, card making. Everyone is different, and one person's interest can appear strange to other people. However, not everyone has time to indulge themselves with their hobby. Mothers of young children, for example, get little free time, and so they appear less obsessed than a single man who spends every weekend, all weekend, playing computer games. Do you think hobbies that keep you fit are better than hobbies that you can do sitting down? No. I think hobbies that open you up to new things are the best, ones that enrich you and give you a new skill. That can be anything, but it is important always to grow as a person and not become boring by never trying anything new. Do you think it can be a disadvantage to have too much free time? <laughs> well, they say that the devil makes work for idle hands, and I think it's true that the less you have to do, the less active you become, and the more time you waste. People who have too much time to spare tend to become lazy and, and lethargic. People who are always on the go, on the other hand, 
think nothing of fitting one more thing into their busy schedules. Should people feel a duty to do something constructive in their free time? No, not necessarily. Everyone deserves some downtime. Modern life is stressful and hectic, and so we need times when we let go of our responsibilities and just do something fun. We can still draw benefits from hobbies that are not generally considered constructive. Um, for example, we can develop our abilities to work in teams by doing team sports, and we can increase our attention spans by um, reading a novel with long chapters. Do people have more free time now than in the past? It's a strange irony that although we now have so many labour-saving devices, such as washing machines and、um, dishwashers, we feel we have less free time. Many of my acquaintances are always complaining that they are too busy, but actually, I think our ancestors had less free time than us. The average worker hardly ever got any time off and worked six or seven days a week. When I hear music from the seventies, it really takes me back. It makes me feel like I'm a teenager again. The memories are so vivid. So many things from that period of my life left a lasting impression on me, like meeting my first girlfriend and sitting my A levels in sweltering heat. It's still fresh in my mind. Two. I can barely remember what I did yesterday, let alone events from my childhood. Well, having said that, I have some vague memories. I remember a teacher I really liked called um. Oh, that the name escapes me, but she was so brilliant at explaining things and was really kind when my brother was taken ill. Oh, what was her name? It's on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, as I said, I have a bad memory. Three. I often reminisce about the good old days. You have to be careful, though, because it's easy to get sentimental and see everything through rose-tinted glasses. Things weren't perfect back then, but you often only remember the good times. I love looking at old photos. They remind me of people I'd long forgotten about, and then it all comes flooding back, like my old friend Alice, who passed away ten years ago. Can it really be that long? Doesn't time fly? What is your most vivid childhood memory? Without a doubt, it's getting my two pet tortoises for my sixth birthday. It was such a surprise, and I was so pleased because none of my friends had such unusual pets. They were tiny; they could both sit in the palm of my hand, and I really enjoyed looking after them. Are you still in touch with your childhood friends?、Mm, some of them, yes. We've all moved on and have very different lives now, but it's nice to catch up from time to time and reminisce. You may have more in common with more recent friends,、uh, but childhood friends feel almost like brothers and sisters, and there's something very special about that relationship. What was your favourite toy when you were a child?、Mm. I always liked toys other children had. For example,、um, a toy car garage with various levels and ramps. <laughs> That was great fun. My best friend had it, and whenever I went over to his house, I would ask to play with it. Sometimes he didn't want to, so I played with it on my own. I loved making the cars whiz around the tracks and crash into each other. Is it important for children to have fun? Um, it is important because I believe children learn a lot through play.、Mm, they learn about the world around them. They learn how to interact with other people. They learn about possible dangers through acting them out. Children shouldn't be made to grow up too fast. They should be allowed to experience the world of make believe first. They spend long enough in the real world as adults. 
I grew up very far from most of my family, so I only saw them once a year. Every summer, I would go to stay with them while my parents continued working. Although I missed my parents, I used to really enjoy spending time with my grandparents, cousins, aunts and uncles. I spent all summer there, nearly two whole months, so from time to time my cousins and I would get bored. We would ask my grandparents if they had any ideas for interesting things we could do. Sometimes they suggested uh, going for a bike ride, sometimes into town to do some shopping. At other times, they showed us a new game to play. (laughs) Then we were happy again. One day, must be about 25 years ago, (laughs) doesn't time fly, all of us got really, really bored and we kept complaining to my grandparents. They were tearing their hair out, trying to think up ideas of where we could go and what we could do. Suddenly, my granddad came up with the idea of going to a new water park that had opened that summer. I hadn't heard about it, but my cousins had, and they told me all about it. It was a park with uh, vast numbers of different pools, some inside, some outside. There were water slides as well. And uh, on top of that, there was not one, but two playgrounds with swings, uh, a merry-go-round and seesaws. (laughs) We were so excited. We set off and on the way we were all singing songs and laughing. We couldn't wait to get there. When we arrived, my cousins and I ran into the park and changed into our swimming costumes. Then we went looking for the most exciting looking pool and we found it, one with brightly coloured tiles and slides. We jumped straight in. We played all day in the park and had a lovely lunch sat on some benches in the sunshine. (laughs) My granddad loved a pool that was filled with spa water. It was dark brown and stank of rotten eggs. I didn't want to go in, but he eventually convinced me. I'm pleased he did, because the water was really warm. I'd never swam in water that warm. I didn't want to get out, despite the terrible smell. I consider it such a happy memory because we enjoyed ourselves so much and I remember so vividly how I felt that day. But there's more to it than just that. When I look back now, I understand how caring my grandparents were and how much they wanted us all to be happy. They would have done anything to help us have a good time. I appreciate that more now that I'm older and have children of my own. I hope we thanked them. I can't remember. But anyway, they were content, I'm sure, to just watch us having an amazing time playing and laughing in the water. So, as you can see, it was a wonderful day and is one of my favourite childhood memories. What other activity did you used to enjoy when you were staying with your family? I loved going for walks in the local park There were people selling all kinds of delicious foods from carts, so my grandparents would invariably buy us some treat, like uh, homemade ice cream or cakes. I remember my granddad often used to take me to school when I was little. I used to live quite far from my school, and my granddad let me cycle there, following behind me on foot. I kept stopping to wait for him to catch up. Then, when we had arrived at school, he would push my bike home again. One day, I was cycling along happily. Suddenly, I looked back, and my granddad was nowhere to be seen. I waited and waited, but he didn't come. I began to get worried, so I cycled back the way I had come, and to my horror, found him lying on the ground. He had tripped on some loose paving. I helped him up and then took him to the doctor's, although he kept insisting he was fine. The doctor examined him and, luckily, he wasn't injured. I was so relieved and always cycled more slowly after that. Do you think people often idealise their childhoods? Certainly they do. The older we get, the more nostalgic we get about the past. It's only normal. And 
Why should we dwell on the negatives? I don't think it does any harm to idealize a bit if it makes us happy to remember things in a more positive light. The only danger is that it may make us unhappy with our current lots to believe that everything was so much better back then. How does a person's childhood influence what kind of adult they become? Well,、uh, I suppose the adult you become is influenced by three main factors. Firstly, your childhood. That is、uh, nurture, then、uh, your genes. That is nature, and last but not least, the choices you make as an adult.、Uh, to my mind, of all three, nurture has the greatest impact. They've conducted research on twins who were separated at birth, and while there are undoubtedly many similarities between them, they are also very different in many key ways. Um, their success in the world of work, their relationships with other people. I think all this is influenced by the role models we have throughout our childhoods. When does a child become an adult, in your view? Hmm, that's a difficult question to answer, and all societies grapple with this issue. It is, of course, critical for the criminal justice system to define an adult correctly, or at least try to. Because if somebody commits a crime as a child, they get treated more leniently than if they commit a crime as an adult. So、uh, I suppose you have to decide when you think people become fully responsible for their actions. I wouldn't want to be the one making that decision. I just don't know. Do you agree with the saying children should be seen and not heard? I'm assuming this means that children should respect their elders and not create havoc by being noisy and answering adults back. I have some sympathy with this view. However, moderation is usually the best course to take in all things, as with upbringing. Children should respect their elders, which involves doing as they're told. Ah,、uh, too many children nowadays think they run the household, making demands, etc. However. It is also true that a child is part of the family too, and also deserves respect. I think this means they should be allowed to express their points of view, and、uh, they should be listened to and consulted. It's a fine balance, I suppose. Is it good for children to be exposed to frightening and sad experiences, or should they be protected from these as far as possible? I don't think they should experience too many sad or terrifying experiences if it can be helped. Nevertheless, what is very useful for teaching children about these darker sides of life without scarring them is stories. In stories, they can learn about evil and the dangers in the world around them, but in a controlled way where the baddies are punished and everyone ends up happy. This gives them a focus for the fears that all children have, but、uh, it is a fictional one, so it doesn't upset their peace of mind. Are children in your country generally well brought up? My instinct is to say no, because you see many misbehaving children when you're out and about. In reality, there are probably many more well brought up children than badly brought up ones. It's just that the good children don't attract your attention as much. Back in the 1960s, this was a nice place to live. Everyone knew everyone, and people looked out for each other. I'm sorry to say that since the 60s, the population has risen dramatically, and this has led to a breakdown in the community ties that used to unite us. Also, second homeowners buy holiday homes here, and. That has meant that the price of property has escalated in recent years, forcing young people to move away from the area. Two. My city is becoming more and more vibrant as time goes on. I love it. It used to be really dull with nothing much for young people to do, but now bars and clubs have begun opening up. The city's no longer just for the older generations with theaters and museums. It's got a new lease of life with a great nightlife and an increasing student population to enjoy it. Three. A century ago, this town was a hive of activity, with its many factories and its port. 
Nowadays, however, it's nowhere near as bustling, as manufacturing has moved elsewhere. But I, for one, don't bewail the changes. There's a certain poignancy and beauty to the disused industrial architecture. And, in fact, many of the old factories are being converted into flats, and they're extremely popular with trendy young couples who are now moving into the town. Do you think men and women tend to have different types of hobbies? Um, yes, I do. The men I know have sports as hobbies. The women usually enjoy more sedentary and peaceful hobbies, like um, reading or crafts. Having said that, there are of course women who love exhilarating hobbies, or are fanatical about cycling or something. And there are men who take up pottery or sewing. There are always exceptions to every rule. Why do some people get obsessed with their hobby? I think everybody finds at least one thing absolutely fascinating. It can be anything. Subjects like um, history of art or a sport like basketball or a craft like um, card making. Everyone is different and one person's interest can appear strange to other people. However, not everyone has time to indulge themselves with their hobby. Mothers of young children, for example, get little free time and so they appear less obsessed than a single man who spends every weekend, all weekend, playing computer games. Do you think hobbies that keep you fit are better than hobbies that you can do sitting down? No. I think hobbies that open you up to new things are the best. Ones that enrich you and give you a new skill. That can be anything. But it is important always to grow as a person and not become boring by never trying anything new. Do you think it can be a disadvantage to have too much free time? <laughs> well, they say that the devil makes work for idle hands, and I think it's true that the less you have to do, the less active you become, and the more time you waste. People who have too much time to spare tend to become lazy and, and lethargic. People who are always on the go, on the other hand, think nothing of fitting one more thing into their busy schedules. Should people feel a duty to do something constructive in their free time? No, not necessarily. Everyone deserves some downtime. Modern life is stressful and hectic, and so we need times when we let go of our responsibilities and just do something fun. We can still draw benefits from hobbies that are not generally considered constructive. Um, for example, we can develop our abilities to work in teams by doing team sports. And we can increase our attention spans by um, reading a novel with long chapters. Do people have more free time now than in the past? It's a strange irony that although we now have so many labour-saving devices, such as washing machines and um, dishwashers, we feel we have less free time. Many of my acquaintances are always complaining that they are too busy. But actually... I think our ancestors had less free time than us. The average worker hardly ever got any time off and worked six or seven days a week. Are historical sites in your country popular with visitors? They seem to be very popular, yes. Um, the last time I went to visit a historical site myself, I was struck by the number of families there with young children. I don't think these sites are popular with young couples necessarily, but it looks to me as though when those couples have children, they suddenly develop a new appreciation for those places. And uh, I suppose they think that finding out about the history of their region and country is an important component in bringing up their children. Is it more important to preserve historical sites or make way for the developments of the future? When a developer wants to build a new shopping centre in my country, for example, they are obliged to conduct an archaeological survey. If any remains are found, archaeologists have to be given time to study it. I think this is marvellous. So, uh, I think old and new can work side by side and you don't necessarily have to choose between them. What do you think will happen to your country's historical sites in the future? Mm. 
I think many of them will continue to be given funding because people realise that you can make lots of money by attracting visitors to historical sites. On the other hand, some are so dilapidated that they require enormous amounts of investment, and I'm not sure they will survive into the future. Some old manor houses, for example. What is culture for you? <laughs> culture can be defined as the way of life of a particular society or section of society. It involves their customs and traditions, and so, in some senses, culture is what distinguishes us from others. What makes us unique? I think culture is also what connects us to our past, to our heritage.、Um, we mustn't forget modern culture either, though. Youth culture is often very vibrant and powerful, with its new and inventive forms of music, dress, and art. Do you think that it is important for a society or culture to have a sense of continuity with the past? Yes, definitely. Change is necessary, but it is also frightening. For this reason, people continue to rely on their traditions to give them a sense of their roots, and to remind them of where they've come from. Commemorating the past is also a way of bringing people together, such as during Independence Day. How will your country's culture have changed in fifty years' time? Hmm, we are becoming more and more multicultural. So I'm not sure that all of our traditions will survive in their current form. For example, can we continue to regard Christmas as our major annual celebration, if perhaps half of the country does not have Christianity as its religion? It would be a shame to lose our traditions. However, if that is indeed the case, something new will, I'm sure, have replaced them in fifty years' time. And maybe it is better to develop new customs and celebrations that more accurately reflect modern society. Is your country popular with tourists? Oh yes, it is. It's a key tourist destination. It isn't popular with sun seekers because, well, <laughs> we don't get a lot of sun.、Uh, but people who are into culture and history love it. We get millions of visitors every year. What sites and activities would you recommend to a tourist visiting your town or region?、Uh, there are a great number of ancient sites near here.、Uh, for example, burial mounds and stone circles. They're fascinating, and I wouldn't hesitate to recommend them to anyone. Luckily, it's actually better if the weather is misty or dismal when you're visiting those sites, because it just adds to the atmosphere. Do you enjoy active holidays? Yes, I certainly do. I hate just sitting on a beach. I love hiking.、Uh, last year, I went hiking in Nepal with some friends. It was incredibly tough, but really rewarding, and I got very fit and trim. We want to do something similar next year if we can save enough money. Tell me what your ideal holiday would be. Hmm. My ideal holidays are when I discover new things, so I wouldn't say I have one ideal holiday in mind.、Um, but it's true that I would love to go to South America,、uh, especially Peru. I believe it's great for hikers, and the landscape just looks breathtaking. I speak some Spanish too, so I could communicate with the locals. I'd like to tell you about the time I went backpacking around Spain. I can't quite believe it, but it was over a decade ago now. Two friends and I got very good value rail passes and travelled around Spain for three months. It was an unforgettable experience. We、uh, started off in Madrid because that's where we landed. We did some sightseeing. We especially loved the parks, and we ate and drank lots. Our、um, favourite thing was, of course, the delicious ham. We liked the nightlife in Madrid too, not least eating out. It was a real experience. The locals don't go out to dinner until really late, often as late as eleven p.m. I suppose because it's so hot. 
So if you turn up at a restaurant at what would be a normal time where we come from, the place is either closed or completely empty. We then journeyed on to Santiago de Compostela in the northwest, which was fabulous. And my friend is really into art, so we had to visit the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao in the north. The weather was dreadful while we were there, so we didn't get the best impression. But even so, we enjoyed it. More people should visit that part of Spain. Then we moved on to um, Barcelona, Madrid's rival city. We fell in love with it. It's so different to Madrid. Um, more bohemian in feel and more multicultural. The Gaudi architecture is so wonderfully wacky, looking half the time like oh, it's fallen off the page of a fairy tale. We were quite sorry to leave Barcelona. After that, we saw Valencia, but not for long, unfortunately, and then we went on to Granada. Oh, what a beautiful, beautiful place. There is nothing quite like the Moorish Palace, the Alhambra, lit up at night. The image has stayed with me. We had wanted to visit Seville and the Extremadura region of the country, but we'd run out of money by then, so sadly we had to leave. It was a memorable holiday because I was with two good friends experiencing all these amazing cities. I don't think I could do it now because travelling so much in a relatively short time is tiring. But we were young and carefree and so took it in our stride. It was the holiday of a lifetime. Why did you choose to go to Spain? Well, um, one of my friends spoke Spanish really well, so it seemed the obvious choice. I don't like going to a country without speaking any of the language, and my friend taught us both Spanish as we travelled round the country, so by the end we could order our food ourselves and talk to people, albeit not on any complex subjects. Do you think it's true that travel broadens the mind? I do, yes. I wouldn't want to disparage people who haven't travelled, because... That is almost invariably due to a lack of opportunity. I doubt any of my great-grandparents' generation ever travelled anywhere. But I can't help but think that it does make you a, a more open-minded person as you see different ways of living, eating, drinking, interacting with others, and it allows you to see your own culture more objectively. It also leads to you having a wider range of experiences and makes you more interesting to talk to. Do young people and older people benefit differently from travelling? I think younger people tend to enjoy adventure and having fun and older people value relaxation more because they have so many responsibilities at home that what they want more than anything is to switch off when they go away. Of course, that's a generalisation and only takes you so far. I know it's true of me, though. How can you make sure you get the most from your travels? I've always thought learning something of the language of the country you're going to is the best possible way of benefiting fully from your holiday. That way, the local population aren't so likely to see you as an outsider but rather as someone who has made the effort of learning some words and expressions, and so has an interest in their culture. What are the positive impacts of tourism? They're manifold. Tourism brings investment and better infrastructure to poorer communities. This means that tourists find it easier to get around, but it also leads to an improved quality of life for the local people. It also brings about greater work opportunities for the local community. Previously, for example, they may just have had fishing or farming, but tourism opens up the possibility of higher earning jobs. What about the negative impacts of tourism? Well... I've seen areas where large numbers of visitors have had a detrimental effect on local habitats. For example, 
coral reefs in the Caribbean. It's really tragic. The best solution, as far as the wildlife is concerned, would be to ban tourism for a few decades to let the reefs recover. But, of course, the local economy has come to rely on tourism, and there would be an uproar if the government were to take that drastic step. How has tourism impacted tourist sites in your country? I think because my country is not a big tourist destination yet, the small number of visitors we get have had only a positive effect. For example, small souvenir shops now have a larger clientele because of the visitors coming to see our temples. Hello, my name is Pauline Jenkins. Could you tell me your full name, please? Thank you. Can you show me your identification, please? All right, that's fine. I'd now like to ask you some questions about yourself. Tell me about where you live. What are the advantages of living there? What are the disadvantages of living there? We're now going to talk about animals. What is your favourite animal? Why do you think some people like keeping pets? Are there any animals you're scared of? Are zoos popular in your country? Let's move on to talk about food. Do you think men or women make the best cooks? Is it important to teach children to cook from a young age? What is a typical dish from your country or region? Do people in your country or region eat traditional food or international food? We've been talking about achievements. I'd like to discuss with you some more questions related to this topic. First, let's consider the role of achievements in the world of education. Do you think that in your country, academic success is more valued than other kinds of achievement, such as achievements in sport? In your opinion, is it recognition and prizes that motivate students to succeed, or is it a personal sense of achievement? What do you think makes some students more successful than others? Now, we're going to discuss motivation and achievement in the workplace. Some people think that a successful person is someone who earns a lot of money. Do you agree? Would you say workers in your country were motivated primarily by money? Do you think people in your country take the same pride in their work as they used to in the past? Thank you. It's been nice talking to you. Hello, my name is Pauline Jenkins. Could you tell me your full name, please? Hello, my name is Marie Dupont. Thank you. Can you show me your identification, please? All right, that's fine. I'd now like to ask you some questions about yourself. Tell me about where you live. I live in Paris, the capital city of France. It's very famous for being a romantic city, the city of love. What are the advantages of living there? It's lively and fun, and you never get bored. You can find any kind of entertainment you can imagine, from bars and clubs to museums and galleries. What are the disadvantages of living there? Um, it's very crowded and quite dirty in parts. You have to know which areas to avoid, too, as some areas have bad reputations, especially at night. We're now going to talk about animals. What is your favourite animal? My favourite animal is the cat. I love cats because they're a lot of fun, uh, very playful, but also seem to have a bit of character, so it's always quite amusing to try to play with your cat. Why do you think some people like keeping pets? Um, I would suspect it's mainly for the company, so that they don't feel alone when they come home in the evening, and they have someone waiting for them. I don't have any pets, though I used to when I was a kid. Are there any animals you're scared of? I have a phobia of snakes. 
I reckon it's because of the way the creature looks, and they can also be venomous. They're aggressive, so if they bite you, you can get very badly hurt. Um, spiders are another animal I'm terrified of. I hate the fast, erratic way they move. Are zoos popular in your country? Um, yes, they are, especially with kids. Kids love discovering new things, including new animals, um, and a zoo is the best place to do that. They can observe a wide range of animals in a safe environment. Let's move on to talk about food. Do you think men or women make the best cooks? Mm, it doesn't depend on the sex of the person, but on their enthusiasm. The men in my family are really good cooks, and they enjoy talking about food as well as cooking and eating it. Is it important to teach children to cook from a young age? The younger the better. Of course, you wouldn't give a young child a knife, but they can mix ingredients together and things like that. The younger they start, the better cooks they'll be when they grow up. What is a typical dish from your country or region? Hmm. Lots of people think we eat frogs' legs all the time. It's a kind of national stereotype. But actually, I've never eaten them. I would say a more typical dish is steak with chips, and it's one of my favourites. Do people in your country or region eat traditional food or international food? We eat both. I regard it as very important to keep culinary traditions alive, but I also love Chinese food and Japanese food and Indian food and loads of other cuisines. I like having variety in my diet. Now, I'm going to give you a topic and I'd like you to talk about it for one to two minutes. You'll have one minute to think about what you're going to say before you begin talking. You can make some notes if you wish. Here is a pencil and some paper. I'd like you to describe a personal achievement you're proud of. All right. Remember, you have one to two minutes to talk on the topic. Don't worry if I stop you. I'll let you know when the time is up. OK. Please start speaking now. OK. Uh, so you asked me to talk about an achievement I'm particularly proud of. So I could have talked about when I passed my university exams uh, or when I bought my first home. But in the end, I decided to talk about the only time I actually won a sports tournament. Only once did I win my village tennis tournament. Um, it was when I was 15 years old. It was particularly difficult because, to be honest, I'm not a great tennis player. And I always played mainly to have fun and not really to win. But that one year, I decided. I made it my goal. I was going to win the village tennis tournament. So I played many matches, lots of them against older players, much older than me, who were members of the club in their uh, 50s. And it was very difficult. Playing older players is always tough. They have more experience, they do all these impressive tricks, and they definitely know how to beat their opponent. And on top of that, it's very much a matter of pride for them. They don't want to lose against one of the younger members of the club. But anyway, I won a few matches against older players, and uh, then I ended up playing the final against my best friend. And that was another difficulty. He was my best friend, so I didn't want to play it too mean with him. But at the same time, I wanted to win. At least the fact that he was my best friend meant that I knew exactly how to beat him, though, because I had played against him many times before. Um... We had a very long game, and it was nerve-wracking. It wasn't very good tennis, but in the end, I won. I'm very proud of my achievement, because I managed to reach the goal I set for myself, and it was something that I know neither the spectators nor the other players would have expected me to accomplish. Thank you. Was your family proud that you won the tournament? Yes, they were. 
We had a big meal to celebrate, and my dad cooked all my favourite things. He's a great cook, so that was a real treat for me. We've been talking about achievements. I'd like to discuss with you some more questions related to this topic. First, let's consider the role of achievements in the world of education. Do you think that in your country, academic success is more valued than other kinds of achievement, such as achievements in sport? No, I don't. I think in my country, successful sports people are looked up to more in society at large as well as at school. Why do you think that is? Well, I think people who are good students are often thought of as nerds and are teased by their classmates. Whereas being good at sport is considered cool, and maybe this is due to the role of celebrity sports people,、uh, David Beckham being the most prominent among them in recent years. They are chased by the paparazzi and given lucrative sponsorship deals, and so on. Yes, I see. In your opinion, is it recognition and prizes that motivate students to succeed, or is it a personal sense of achievement? I would say they hanker after recognition from their teachers, and perhaps envy from other students.、Uh, I know that was the case for me, if I'm honest. It may be though that if someone is particularly timid, they would actually shy away from any special recognition of their efforts. Right. And what do you think makes some students more successful than others? Although, as I said, most students are motivated by recognition, I do think that those who are the most successful in the long run are those who have intrinsic motivation, and that is because you don't always get congratulated publicly for everything you do. So, someone who does things only for that would soon stop making an effort. You know? Yes, that's a good point. Now we're going to discuss motivation and achievement in the workplace. Some people think that a successful person is someone who earns a lot of money. Do you agree? No, I would define it as、um, someone who benefits others. Right. Can you explain what you mean? Yes.、Um, I mean that working just for the money could be considered selfish. Most people do it, and I don't judge people for having that as their primary objective. Nevertheless, those who work to help others are more inspirational. Nurses, for example, who really don't earn much, or youth workers, who often don't get much appreciation for their hard work, or those who do voluntary work with the homeless, or something like that. Yes, so you would say that most workers in your country were motivated primarily by money. I would. Yes, it's only normal. People have families to feed, and given the choice of a low-paid job that benefited others and a higher-paid job that benefited their own family,、uh, it's only reasonable that most would choose the latter. It's possible that those who choose the former kind of job are single or young, and so don't have that many responsibilities. Okay, and what about how things in the workplace have changed? Do you think people in your country take the same pride in their work as they used to? Hmm, that's a tough question. I'm inclined to say no. Why do you say that? Because many people in my country now work for huge companies, they may never even have seen their managing director and certainly don't know him or her very well. They don't have any reason to take pride in doing the job to a high standard because feedback is limited.、Um, in the past, companies were not only smaller but tended to be family-run, so everyone had something invested. I mean, personally speaking, in the business, they cared about the success of the business. Thank you. It's been nice talking to you. Thank you very much.